Dr. Paul Lee Tan graduated from Dallas Theological Seminary with a Master of Theology and at Grace Theological Seminary with a Doctor of Theology. A pastor, a seminary professor, and a Bible prophecy speaker for 50 years to over 500,000 people worldwide, he authored several popular books on prophecy and illustrations. Rev. Dr. Paul Lee Tan is a founding pastor and senior pastor emeritus of Grace Christian Church of the Philippines and the senior chaplain emeritus of Grace Christian College. He is the former director of Asian Studies at Dallas Theological Seminary. I have the honor and the privilege to present to you Rev. Dr. Paul Lee Tan. Good day, everyone. I am told that you are, I am told that you are the best of the best, the cream of the crop of students at Grace Christian College. Today, all of you, just about a hundred or two hundred of you, and so congratulations. That means that you have all worked very hard in school, uh, and the school recognize you as a very special student. So you are special witnesses of what God can do for anyone who does his or her best and to trust him. We are all so proud of you. However, dear young people, you are in high school and your life's future lies before you. You want to continue succeeding in all that you do. As someone has said, Success must continually be won. Success is never fully achieved in life. Now today, the topic given me is the, the God-blessed person. How to be a God-blessed person. Now this is a very important subject, especially for high school students like you, because you are starting to build good foundations for your lifetime. So your high school years are very important in setting life's goals and directions. I speak from a, a little experience of my own. Uh, recently, I wrote a book, 600 pages. It's called Experiencing God's Grace, an 80-year journey. Actually, I'm 83 now. But anyway, this book uh, was a uh, was uh, printed and published last year. In this book, I describe God's leading in my life from childhood to the present. And looking back, dear friends and young people, looking back, it was really my high school years that impacted my entire life. There in 1950 at Naktahan Street, the new Grace Christian High School started. And our school influenced my life's directions, uh, even now, uh, today. I would uh, tell more later as we go along. Well, okay, let me first give a personal testimony of how God called me to be a pastor 70 years ago at Grace Christian High School. Looking back again, I think I was the worst candidate for God's calling me when I was 15 years old and still in high school. I was shy, I was very shy. I had a hoarse voice. I, um, I was not eloquent like a, a, a pastor should be. I was also very naughty, a bad student and troublemaker in school. Uh, you may doubt me, but I, I was, I'm, I'm telling the truth. <laughs> And also I had failing grades. I had many failing grades in my elementary and high, even high school years. My report card looked like the Christmas tree, a lot of red color. But you know, when God called me, then my life changed in high school. Then I had purpose in life. I committed, even in high school, to serve Christ all my life. Now, how did it happen? Well, one night in 1953, 
sorry, in 1952, I read the Bible on Christ's crucifixion. I, I was uh, the principal's, uh, one of principal's son. So we live in that three-story building in Naktahan. I still remember the porch. There I kneeled there one night alone on that porch that night without telling anyone. And I read the Bible on the crucifixion of Christ, like we are read, like what we are reading now in this Holy Week. You know, I had to kneel down while reading it. I just could not sit down reading it. In, in, in the Gospel of John, Jesus died for me, for my sins. So I want to give my life to him. And so now, whenever I had hardships and difficulties, I always remember that night I committed my life to Christ when I was 15 years old. Christ died for me. What would I not give to him? After high school and college, I went to seminary in, in Texas, in, in the States. I was so happy to be studying the Bible full time and to prepare for my lifetime of service for the Lord in 1962. But I decided first to test if God is really almighty and if God could take care of me all my life and if I could trust him for real all my life. And so there at Dallas Theological Seminary, I was alone uh, as a foreign student from the Philippines. I went to the business office of the seminary one day and returned all the scholarship. I received from the seminary. I returned, I wanted to work my own way through seminary. And so I worked as a janitor in a factory at night for four years during seminary while studying during daytime. I worked at night up to midnight. At that time in 1960s, I was paid only $1 an hour. Imagine $1 an hour. And so I learned to budget. Uh, Everything was, has to be very budgeted. I learned to budget with $1 for three meals. Can you do that? Uh, 50 peso to, for three meals every day. I went to the supermarket and bought the cheapest chicken. At that time, chicken was the cheapest, even now. And back cabbage and then rice. But I had variety. One day was rice, chicken, cabbage. The next day was cabbage, rice, chicken. Another day was chicken, cabbage, rice, and so on. And you know what? I got fat. Yeah. Uh, so I decided that, yes, God will take care of me and I can trust God all my life. So I made a commitment to the Lord. When I was a teenager like you, I said, I will never receive any salary from any church when I am a pastor. I just want to serve God directly uh, and not to be obligated to anyone. And you know, praise God, God can, when we go into partnership with God and commitment with God, God, we can find God really, our almighty God and loving savior. These 50 years, as a pastor in both Philippines and USA churches, I never receive any salary and also avoid receiving any love gifts also. God provided so that I could write some books and from my own books, be able to, 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 to survive. But anyway, God is real, dear, dear young people. In 1967, when I was studying for my Doctor of Theology degree, in the United States. My mother, the principal of Grace School, Mrs. Julatan, wrote me and asked me to return to Manila to help her start the Grace Christian Church, the new Grace Christian Church inside Grace Village. Actually, Grace Village has no one living inside the village. It was new, maybe just one house or two, that's all. Why start a church? Well, the Grace Christian Church was not started for Grace Village. It was started for the school 
it was to be a student church for the students because there are hundreds and even one or two thousand students there. So I immediately returned to Manila to be pastor here in Grace Village. I was the youngest and maybe the handsomest, just kidding, pastor in Manila. Anyway, uh, uh, at that time, there were only about 30 members in church and we were meeting inside the Grace Christian High School third floor classroom in one of the classrooms in the third floor. In 1967, when I returned back to Manila, I was a, a pastor without experience, fresh out of seminary, a pastor here at Grace Christian Church, no experience. And some church members were my own elementary teachers. They taught me in, in elementary school. I was too scared to preach to them in church. But one day I went to a missionary and the missionary said, just hide behind the Bible. I, rem I still remember that when I was about uh, 29 years old. I just hide behind the Bible. And I still remember. And so every Sunday I preach from the Bible verse by verse. I hide behind the Bible in our church. Grace Christian Church grew to 150 members. That was called Bible Expository Preaching. Now in 1974, when our church grew to 150 members, we were burdened to, to build a church, a new church building program. And I told the architect, Mr. Felipe Mendoza, to design a big church for us. And he said, for how big? I said, for 1,000 to 1,500 members, uh, God gave uh, faith to see into the future, the vision that our church needs a big uh, building. We were only 150 members, 10 times bigger. And many deacons, I remember, were surprised that their pastor would want to build such a big church. And a few deacons even resigned. So they appointed me to be chairman of the church building committee. No, you know, with God's help and lots of prayers, our large church building today was built only in one and a half year, 18 months, including office and parcel, everything. And our total budget was only 1 million, no, sorry, 1.4 million pesos. Of course, the peso was worth more at that time in 1975. God can do wonderful things through us when we trust in him. You notice the little Volkswagen parked on the, by the guardhouse of the church on the left, middle left. That's my car, <laughs> the pastor's car. When, when I want to go visiting and go out with the Volkswagen, the guard would have to push me, push the car to get it started and so on. Those were the early days, early days. And God can do mighty things through you too, every one of you, so special before God, so talented, gifted and devoted to God. God can make you a success in life. Now let's go on and we will, uh, be in another topic, which leads to our main topic of how to be a God-blessed person. The Bible. The Bible. I want to talk about the importance of the Bible because the Bible is really our only guide to life and to practice and to doctrine. Now, there are 66 books of the Bible. 66 books in one single book, the Bible. But I think one of the best books of the Bible, of the 66, is the book of Psalms. The book of Psalms can be used when we want to study how to be a, su a successful person in life. There are 150 chapters in Psalms, the largest book in the Bible. 
And this book is so large and also located at the center, at the exact center of the Bible. If you close your Bible and then close your eyes and then open the Bible at random, at the center, you would always arrive at the book of Psalms. That's how important it is to God. God placed the book of Psalms right at the middle of his word. Now, the entire book of Psalms with 150 chapters can be summarized just in one chapter. And that is in chapter one. Chapter one. Chapter one, today we will just study the first two verses of chapter one. And that's enough to tell us how to be the blessed man and woman. In verse one, we find there are three things we must not do. In verse two of Psalms one, we find two things we must do to be a successful and God-blessed person. Okay, let's go and see what it is. Three things we must not do. Psalms 1, 1. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor seated in the seat of the scornful. Now I'm reading from the King James Version. Uh, and in this very first verse, three phrases jump out. Walk not, stand not, and sit not. Don't walk, don't stand, don't sit in the ways of sinners. You know, usually in Satan's temptation, when Satan tempts us, a person first would just, oh, just follow along with, with it. And then they would just stand and linger with it. And then finally sit down with evil people. But the blessed man does not do all these three things. Let us study these three things in more closely here. Walk not in the way of the wicked or walk not in the counsel of the ungodly. Now there are the advice and words of ungodly people uh, in surrounding our lives. Every day in our daily lives, we often meet people who like to talk they want to give us advice how to live our lives. In the English language, there is a saying that talk is cheap. It's really cheap. It means people can talk, talk, talk because it doesn't cost them one centavo. Well, Satan will give advice. People will talk and give advice wherever we are. But dear precious young people, if their talk causes you not to be godly or causes you to throw away your Christian, Christian principles or to feel proud and remember to run away. Run away fast and emphasize Christ only. The Bible says that's the way to become the blessed man in life. Secondly, the blessed man does not stand in the way of sinners. Now, as a pastor of about 50 years now, 25 years in the Philippines, pastor, and another 25 in America, several churches, when people come to me and say they are, they are unjustly treated by others, that they feel hurt, that when people come to me for advice, I would advise them to Take the high road. Don't struggle with wicked people in the mud because you will get dirty. Just be big hearted. Jesus said in the Beatitudes, blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth. Matthew chapter five, verse five. The meek is supposed not to get anything, but Jesus said they will ultimately inherit everything the earth. You want to be great? Then be the least of all. That's Jesus' counsel and teaching. Because Jesus said the last shall be first. And so on. Let me tell a, a story about myself. When I was studying at 
Dallas Theological Seminary, I have to work at night and study in the daytime as a janitor at night. The pay was only $1 an hour, as I said. But to get to work to the factory was to downtown Dallas. I had to, to walk fast and almost run, partly, to get there in time to get to the punch clock to start my evening work. And so I bought an old bicycle for $10. I had to work 10 hours to buy that bicycle. Well, anyway, soon after I was rich enough to buy a car, a car, you for how much, you know, for $50. This is my car, $50 car in Dallas. It was 10 years old when I was born. It was in 1947, built in 1947. It's called the DeSoto. The, the DeSoto company already went bankrupt. Well, that car had dents all over the body. All the windows were broken. When it ran, I had to insert cardboard pieces to keep out the water. And I parked the car in the seminary parking lot. Uh, and my classmate would smile and laugh at me and say, that's a runaway from the junkyard. Anyway, I could use it to go to work, to the factory at night and I could get it driving, but always at a slow lane only. Anyway, once I was filling up in a gas gasoline station, they opened the hood and the gas attendant wanted to buy my car, the horn of my car, my car's horn. I said, why? He said, it's an antique. It's shaped like a trumpet. <laughs> at that time, that's the horn of cars. So the horn itself is worth more than the car. Well, anyway, I said, okay, but, but I cannot sell it. I need a horn to operate the car. Later, I can sell it. Then one day, when I went to get my car in the parking lot seminary, I could not find my car. It was missing. Someone stole it. Someone took it. I was so surprised that anyone in Dallas was, would be poorer than I was to even steal my $50 car. So I was back to my old bicycle, but I determined to find my car. So I used the bicycle to look for my car. At that time, Dallas was much smaller. And I know that South Dallas is where the poorer section is in the South. So I bike to the South section of Dallas looking for my car. One day, I found the car, my car in the person's driveway. I knocked at the door. A big guy opened the door. I said, sir, I am sorry, but that is my car in, in the driveway. And he got angry, said, that's my car. I said, no, it's mine. I can prove it. I, I can prove it with all the dents and damage there. And he said, no, it's mine now. You know, like you cannot argue with, 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 with bad people. I got scared. So I said, okay, I will give you my car. But you have to go with me to Dallas City Hall to transfer a uh, title to register under your name. Because I know that if he drove, drove my car and there's an accident, I would still be responsible. And the man said, okay, I will go with you. <laughs> So he drove the car with me beside him and we registered the car under his name. And so that was, so I was back to my old bicycle again. And you know, dear friends, during those days in seminary, I felt like a loser. It, but I was very happy because God called me to study the Bible there in seminary, even though I don't have much money or much, but I could study and work hard. I could teach Bible classes and lead people to Christ. That's even more important. So don't stand, stand in the ways of sinners. You'd get dirty. The last shall be first, Jesus said. For unreasonable and evil people, don't fight them, run away. 
even if I have to give away my $50 DeSoto car. The Bible says, number three, don't sit in the seat of scoffers. Scoffers or scorners are those who like to criticize, to complain, and to blame others. I had a classmate in, in high school at Grace. He complains about everything. He's so pessimistic. His father, later I found out his father was working in a cemetery <laughs> he, he, uh, in, as a, in association of the Chinese cemetery, you know, there. Anyway, I don't want to be his friend because I would be affected. And in Dallas Seminary, there was another classmate too, who complained a lot. He was really a promising young American uh, man. He was a college professor before he came to seminary. And his wife had prayed for him for many years to be a pastor. And we worked together as janitors in the factory at night. And during that time, from the Philippines, I was so innocent. I thought all my professors in Syria were very, were very good, the best in the world. And I wanted to be a good student. However, at night, during our break time at work, my classmate would criticize all the professors in seminary. He tried to destroy my faith in the seminary, even my doctrine, critical of everything. And you know what? I began to also have a bad opinion about my professors. But one day, before the Lord, I decided that was wrong. And even though we had to work together at night, I tried to avoid him and not to talk to him as much as possible because I found I was also getting critical and losing my innocence. And one day, even before the year was over, my classmate, the one who complained so much, had dropped out of seminary. He sold all his seminary books to us, and then he left town. He went back to teach in college. His wife was so disappointed. Today, the Lord could not use him in the, in the ministry. In fact, God took him to heaven. And so in Psalms chapter one, verse one, we see a wise person who was not involved in three bad things. Walk not, stand not, sit not in the ways of evil people. Remember, sin and temptation cannot hurt us unless we stop and accept it. Now, after talking about three things we should not do. The Psalms goes on to describe two things that we must do to be a God-blessed person. Two things in verse two. It says, but his delight is in the law of the Lord and in his law that he meditate day and night. I love the first word of verse two, but, B-U-T, but, his delight is in the law of the Lord. Here is a person who is not always negative. No, no, no. He is very positive. He has made a 180 degree turn. He is full of good positive signs. What is he doing? First, he delights in the law of the Lord, the Bible. And delight is such a beautiful word delight. If a person asks you, what do you really like? Can you say, I like the Bible. I like to read it every day, all the time. It is one thing to know the Bible. It's another thing to enjoy reading it, listening to it, accepting it in our life. Do you like to study the words of the Bible? Just slowly enjoying it like a piece of steak eating a piece of steak or something you like, reading the Bible slowly, sentence by sentence, word by word, chapter by chapter. 
in English, there is a slogan called, taste it, you like it. That's so true for God's word, the Bible. You can read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation in just about 60 hours. 60 hours through and through from start to the end through the Bible. Imagine if you have to ride the car back and forth from home to school. I know probably you cannot now, but in normal times, it took it probably took you about an hour each, each way. You know what? You can finish listening to the Bible on the car tape recorder in one month only. In one month, you could read through the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. In a year, you could listen to all the Bible 12 times. It is very sad that some people in, on earth, Christians, never even read the Bible once in their lifetime. We can never read the Bible too much. And so in Psalms chapter 1, verse 2, this blessed man is positively enjoying the law of the Lord. Let me tell another story, testimony, about my mother who founded Grace Christian College First High School. My mother also founded Hope Christian High School in downtown Chinatown. I thank God that I grew up in a devoted family in the Philippines. And after my, my parents were busy people, my father opened a piano store uh, and sold many pianos. My mother was principal of the Christian school. But right after our supper at night, after supper, even before all the family children, we were five children, all scattered for the night, my parents would call a short time of devotions, family devotions time. Right after supper, but my father would go upstairs and get dressed nicely. He would say to worship the King of Kings. And my mother would give each child his or her own hymn book, hymnal, to sing. We sing through the church hymnal. Then mother would read Bible stories, chapter after chapter, mostly from uh, the, the historical books, First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, the Life of Christ, the Gospels, and the Book of Acts, so on. My mother would read the Bible chapter of church chapter, and we would just listen, transfix. And then, when later we go to sleep at night, we would dream. We would dream about Bible heroes when we are asleep. That's my recollection of my childhood. After that. My parents would then tell us interesting stories uh, during the devotions about our own family history and tell us about how they came to the Philippines from China during their honeymoon and then decided to stay because they loved the Philippines. And they would tell us about our grandfather and so on and so forth. Many interesting family stories, histories, and we learn many practical lessons for faith and trusting in God. And then we would close the devotions when everyone would kneel down by, by his or her chair and saying a short or long prayer by taking turns. That's every night, family devotions when I, I was growing up. When I got married, I talked with my wife, Helen, and we decide to continue this good tradition. So the two of us, before going to sleep, we would kneel and pray. And then gradually, we would have our family, three little children, Christine, Stephen, and Samuel, 
growing up in Dallas, Texas, doing the same thing in family devotions. How wonderful. The Bible, you cannot have too much of it. It always will transform us and bless us. And the Bible says, in his law that he meditated day and night. The second thing we must do to be God blessed is to meditate on the Bible passages day and night. May I ask you something? What are you thinking all day? Psychologists say that every day an average person has 10,000 different thoughts, 10,000. That adds up to 3,500,000 thoughts a year. You know, your mind and mine are thinking all the time. Whether we realize it or not, we are thinking about things. Are we thinking about things that will last for eternity? When we think about God's word, when we memorize God's word, when we sing hymns that relate to the Bible and Christian life, we will become the blessed man. Use your 10,000 thoughts every day wisely. Dear friends, in these last days, we believe these are God's last days. Jesus is coming very soon, but Satan is working overtime against us and against our Lord. He wants, Satan wants us to live just for today. Let us depend on God's word and live for eternity. Meditate on it day and night. Some time ago, I visited a pastor in Taiwan. He was my student at the seminary. I was surprised when I went to his church office on his table, I saw 10 different Bibles, all torn up and worn out because of constant reading. This seminary student, my student, was also pastoring the church. He grew, he grew the church from 10 people to 1,000 people in less than three years. His secret, you see it right there on his table, 10 different Bibles worn out. 50 years ago, America sent a spaceship Apollo 14 to the moon. That day, the astronauts deposited a complete copy of the Bible on the moon in microform format. For the first time in human history, there is a Bible in the moon on the moon. Although the Bible is a very ancient book, it is today's bestseller every year, every year without exception, even up to now. King David told us that the Bible is perfect, 100% adequate for all our needs. Do you need comfort, young people? Do you need strength, extra strength? Do you have tears and joy? Do you need wisdom? All these are provided in the Bible. Turn to the Bible. The Bible can change a sinner into a saint. It can give peace and joy to your families and your friends. Maybe some of you may ask, what is written in the Bible? Let's quickly, just an outline of the Bible today. The Bible is like a book shelf, bookcase, with 66 books, as we mentioned, Genesis to Revelation. These 66 books are divided into two parts, the Old Testament and the New Testament. The, the Bible is really telling the story of only one person, Jesus Christ. The Old Testament tells about before Christ came to earth, and the New Testament tells about what happened after Christ came to earth to save us. It's easy to remember the books of the Bible, 
the Old Testament has 39 books and the New Testament has 27. It's easy to remember, just remember the number three for Trinity. Three, then three times three equals 39. 39 books in the Old Testament. Then three and then times nine would be 27. 27 books in the New Testament. That's what uh, I do as a mental uh, help. Now, the Old Testament has 39 books divided into five subdivisions. Five books, it starts with five books of Moses, written by Moses, from Genesis to Deuteronomy. It's called the law. Then there are 12 books all on history. If you like history, it starts with Joshua all the way to Esther. Then if you want to be wise, read the wisdom books, five books, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Solomon. Then if you love to read about what's going to happen in the future or in, in a prophecy past or present, read the major prophets and the minor prophets. Five major prophets, Isaiah all the way to Daniel, and the 12 minor prophets, Hosea to Malachi, to Malachi. Now let's go to the New Testament. Again, the same five subdivisions. First, start with the gospel, the four gospels as we know it, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Then the historical book would be just one book, the book of Acts. Very interesting, the book of Acts. It should be titled the Acts of the Holy Spirit. Then Paul, Paul's epistle, Paul wrote most of the book of the New Testament. He wrote 14 books from Romans all the way to um, many believe the book of Hebrews. Find, then the fourth subdivision would be other general epistle, which would be other smaller books written by James, by Peter, by John, and by Jude. James and Jude were the two stepbrothers of Jesus himself. Then finally, of course, the book of Revelation, one single book, but so full of mysteries and revelations about the future uh, coming uh, uh, events. So that's the New Testament. Now, uh, just quickly, I'd like just quickly just to review the first five books of the Bible, the law, all written by Moses, the first five books. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, all are in story form, all written by Moses. Look at the life of Moses. His life could be evenly divided into three parts. Zero year to 40, he was the prince of Egypt in Pharaoh's court, growing up there. 40 to 80, he was, he escaped to the Sinai Peninsula because he killed uh, a person uh, and the king who was after him. So he became, uh, he hid, hid in, the, in the desert as a lone, lowly shepherd of Sinai. It, it was God's will so that later he would bring the Israelites through the big and terrible Sinai Peninsula. He, he knew it because he spent 40 years there as a shepherd. Then for the next another 40 years, he led two to three million Israelites through the Sinai desert to the border of the promised land. He died without entering the promised land when he was 120 years old because he was disobedient to the Lord only once. God forbid him to enter the promised land. Let's go on. The first book of Genesis is very important. It tells about the beginning of everything, the beginning of all things. If your classmates ask you, how did all things begin? Point them to the book of Genesis. 
all things were created by God. The sky, the earth, the sea, everything in it, God created. Even the Chinese word for blessing, fu, uh, blessing, the Chinese word, is composed of God, one man, and in the garden. Those ancient Chinese inventing the Chinese characters, they, they live they, they, in ancient times in Babylonia before they migrated to China. And they brought all those early Genesis account with them. Uh, it's and created and formed in the Chinese characters. We don't have time to study it, but there's, there are books on that. Then came Noah. The world was became very wicked and sinful. God had to recreate, had to, had to restart the human race. Noah, the great builder of the earth, two by two, all animals came into the earth. And then the, the big flood came. If you want to see a true replica of it, uh, go to Kentucky. There, uh, they built a, a exact replica uh, of the art that's very popular in the States and internationally today. Suddenly in Genesis, the middle of Genesis, well, in early chapter 12, we see one person called Abraham come up. Abraham started the Jewish race, which gives us the Messiah Jesus in the New Testament. So from Genesis chapter 12, all the way to the end of the Bible, it tells about the Jews, and of course, the Christians who would believe in Christ as Savior. So from Genesis chapter 12 to the end of the Old Testament, it's a history of the Jews. Now, Abraham originally lived in modern day Iraq, near the Persian Gulf there, called Ur, Babylon. God called him to go out and go to Canaan, which is in Israel, about 1,000 miles away. That was about AD 2000. Abraham had a son called Isaac. Isaac had a son called Jacob. Jacob had a son called Joseph. And, and in Genesis, it tells about their stories and histories, their success and also their failures, their failures. Jacob, we read a lot about him in Genesis. Only two events. Jacob dreamed about the heavenly ladder. Jacob, angels up and down the ladder with God speaking to him, as telling him God is with him even though he's on a long journey. And then he wrestled with the angel. He tells about it, Jacob. Joseph, his story is even more in Genesis. Jacob had 12 sons and, and his brother sold Joseph as a slave to Egypt. But there in Egypt, God blessed him. He became the prince of Egypt. He interpreted Pharaoh's dreams. And Joseph forgave his brothers and welcomed all his family to Egypt. There were about 70 people and the entire chosen people all lived in Egypt for 430 years. Where did they live? They live in the best part of Egypt, the Bible says, called Goshen. That's the Nile Delta. The Egypt only have one river. Everywhere it's called Nile. Like in Manila, everywhere it's called Basic River. Basic. Anyway, there in Goshen, Joseph, the ruler of Egypt, gave his own family members, 70 of them, the best land in Egypt. And this closed the book of Genesis. Now, because of the fertile land, the 70 people became two to three million people. They became a nation. That's how the nation of, of Israel started in Egypt. But there in Egypt, in Exodus, the second book, it tells us there was a new king who came up who did not remember Joseph. And he put all the Jews uh, into slavery, become his slaves. 
And so there was a need to be exodus to go out. Exodus means going out, going out of Egypt, back to the promised land. Soon they had to leave Egypt. Why? Because in Egypt, they worship so many, many gods. They worship the sun god Ra. They worship the cow. They worship the beetle. They worship the ugly animal, the dog, the, the bird, crocodile. They worship lion, goat, everything. The Israelites could not worship God really devotedly in Egypt. They had to go out back to the promised land, which they did. Moses appeared to Pharaoh, said, let my people go. But Pharaoh said, no, they're my slaves. Finally, God had to use 10 plagues, 10 series of plagues, finally killing Pharaoh's son before Pharaoh would let the Israelites live at the Passover. And so they had to cross the Red Sea to go out and the Egyptian armies were pursuing them behind. God opened the Red Sea and they crossed the Red Sea on dry land. Then they come to the Mount, to the Sinai Peninsula. It's, it's still the same now, still the same, desert, all desert. At that time, there were three roads from Egypt to the Pyramid to Canaan, but the Israels, Israelites used a, not a road, they went all the way down, down to Sinai Peninsula, all the way below, because they were slaves, they were not fighters, because there were Egyptian armies guarding those number one and two roads. So they went to a road that is not a road, all the way down to Mount Sinai and stayed there for one year. There at Mount Sinai, God gave them the law. God gave them the tabernacle, they built a tabernacle and from the Holy of Holies, there was a pillar of cloud at, at daytime and a pillar of fire at night. And at the center of, of the holy place is what they call the Ark of the Covenant where God spoke to his people through, through Aaron, the high priest. Why the pillar of cloud in daytime? Because it's so hot during daytime, during uh, in Sinai, when we go there in tour, Holy Land tour, even the bus, the big, good uh, tourist bus uh, are, are hot with air conditioning on because Sinai is really hot during daytime. And the cloud, God knows that they need an umbrella. So the cloud becomes their umbrella through the desert. Why a fire at night, pillar of fire at night? Because Sinai is pitch dark at night. When the sun sets, it's just dark, dark. Uh, you could get lost there. We will warn our tour members to just watch for each other and, and with flashlight. light. So God used a pillar of fire at night to guide them through the Sinai Peninsula. And so Exodus tells a lot of their story, read about it. And so finally they come to the border of the promised land, Canaan. And there Moses could not go into the promised land. He went up Mount Nebo and view. God opened up the way there so that he could view the whole promised land from Lebanon all the way to the Dead Sea. He could view it, the Bible says. And then God buried him up on Mount he died. And the next leader was Joshua. Joshua. We don't have time to, to say anymore about this. Maybe the question is, did Moses enter the promised land? And the answer is no. But I would tell the members, the answer is yes. Why? In the life of Jesus, in the New Testament, one day Jesus went up the mount and in the Mount of Transfiguration, he was, Jesus talked with Moses and Elijah. Also Moses was given the blessing finally of stepping on the promised land, talking with Jesus there that day. So how to be a God-blessed person? First, three things not to do. Secondly, 
two things you must do. Meditate on God's word. Now the thirdly, the third point finally is, let God's way be your way. Verse six of Psalms chapter one says, the last verse of chapter one, for the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Let God's way be your way and you will be successful. In other words, go into partnership with God. Use God's way, not your way, and you will always be successful. 60 years ago, when I was in junior high school, God called me into a full-time ministry. At that time, I had a problem. I was failing in most of my studies. I, I just, my report card, as I say, looked like a Christmas tree. My mind was not open. I just could not fi figure out how X plus Y could be equal to Z. And my classmate in grade school would look at me and smile. I said, oh, you wanted to be a pastor someday? Who is your God? One night I prayed to God saying, dear God, it's so embarrassing. I have many failures in my report card. But in the Old Testament, I say, God, you told a young man to ask you for anything and you will give it to him. And that young man asked for wisdom. And that was Solomon, as you know. And God gave him wisdom and as well other blessing, young King Solomon. So I, I bargained with God. I said, dear God, please ask me the same question and I will also give the same answer. I will ask for wisdom. And then I continued. I say, God, to prove that you will answer, you are the answer, prayer answer God, answering God. Please allow me to graduate a valedictorian, top honor. I told God that I wanted to tell everyone about God calling me to, to be a pastor someday. But since only during the graduation ceremony, only the the valedictorian could give a speech. I needed to be a valedictorian. And you know what? That's impossible, <laughs> impossible. But God gave me a, 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 a desire to try very hard. Oftentimes I would study through the night, all night, and God proved faithful. At the end, I did not graduate as valedictorian but as salutatorian, second honor, not to worry because uh, the school said our great point average are very, very close, 0 0.01. So the school allowed me also to give a speech, another speech that day. And dear graduates, dear, dear young people, I was so happy that day to tell everyone that I'm going to be, I was called by God in high school to be a pastor. And that confirmed it all my life until now. Dear, dear young people, with men it is impossible. With me it's impossible, but not with God. Pray, make commitments and promises with the Lord. Go into partnership with God. With God, all things are possible. Let God's way be your way and you will succeed. Conclusion, these 80 some years of my life, I found out four things. First, God does not depend on how smart we are or how eloquent or how good we are. It all depends on how faithful, how faithful and submissive we are to him. That makes the difference. Secondly, I found out that I'm willing, if I'm willing to do the small things well, and faithfully, then he will entrust us with bigger things. Thirdly, I must always emphasize the Bible in my Christian life, and I must always be true to the word of God. Finally, I found out in everything, always to tell myself, I am just an unworthy servant of God. I serve Christ because he died for me and for you. Finally, 
So we all read this verse together. Uh, this is my at my life verse. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know that your labor is not in vain, it's eternal. It's for eternity. It has eternal value in the Lord. So we all bow in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this time of sharing God's word. Thank you for each of these precious young people today, everyone so talented, gifted, and devoted to God, and they are loved and nurtured by loving parents. I pray a special blessing, Lord, on these young people. Success now in their school studies and achievement in their blessing others in their future lives. Lord, may all our students here know and trust Jesus Christ as their personal Savior first and then live for Christ who died for them. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you so much. God bless all of you.